Welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining me for this module on Premium Diversity, Equity, Inclusion in IDP Intervention and Strategies. I'm Renata Schiavo and serve as the Principal at Strategies for Equity and Communication Impact, a woman-owned global consultancy that focuses on helping other organizations achieve their mission by promoting behavioral, social and organizational change via social innovation, community engagement, social and behavior change communication, and system change strategies. I also wear several other hats. I'm a senior lecturer at Columbia University, Millman School of Public Health. I serve as the founder and board president on the board of director of Health Equity Initiative, a nonprofit member-driven organization. And I actually um, I have other affiliations which are listed on this slide. I'm very pleased to partner with Safe State Alliances on this module. While I only marginally worked on injury and violence prevention and primarily in the context of child health and adverse childhood experiences, Across my different endeavors, I work to advance health, racial, and social equity. I consider myself an advocate for health equity and a committed voice on the importance of addressing and removing barriers that prevent people from leading healthy and productive lives. I think this is very relevant to the module and to the topic of today, and I'm very pleased to partner and receive state alliances on this module. So what about this module? First, we will start taking a moment for self-reflection on the topics that we will be covering and uh, some questions that we should really try to integrate in our daily life but to assess how what we're doing with diversity, equity, and inclusion and how we can strive to incorporate it in our work and personal experiences. Then we will be covering what is DEI and why it matters, what is health equity and why it matters, and how do we frame DEI in an injury and violence prevention prevention, intervention, and strategies. As many of you know, injury violence prevention is a very complex process. It starts with building a local uh, stable infrastructure and then collecting, analyzing, and disseminating data, selecting program and policy strategies, uh, engaging people for partnership and other organizations for partnership, communicating about uh, basically injury violence prevention and provide training and technical assistance. Uh, framing the AI across this entire process is a very important and timely topic. Uh, something we will not be covering in this model uh, is a step-by-step -step approach to the AI center IDP planning and also the theoretical foundation of the AI as well as statistics on injury and violence uh, rates and IVP inequity. And for uh, the purpose of brevity, I will be, be referring to injury and violence prevention as IVP and to injury and violence uh, to IV when I discuss inequities or rates of these two very important parameters. I also want to mention that this is a very introductory module on the topic. So, Let's take a moment for self-reflection. First, please take a moment to assess your own mental models in thinking about inequities in injury violence prevention or injury or violence rates. What do you think is the cause of inequity in IVP, IV rates? What is your attitude toward prevention? Who or what do you think is responsible for prevention? The answer to this question and the framing you will be using will also determine how you will approach intervention, a policy design, and we will summarize examples and mental models that are impact on inequities at the end of this reflection. Let's move forward now with reflecting on your own biases. We know that most people have biases. But being aware of them and making sure they don't affect our decision-making process and do not contribute to reinforcing inequities is key to our own work and to our own personal life. Checking on one on biases should happen regularly. So please let's take a moment to reflect on this question. Can you think of any moment in which you felt that personal experience of bringing your cultural background may influence your opinion on any other group or community? Are you aware of how bias shows up in your community, workplace, school, and other settings? Does it affect any of those places? Are you able to identify stereotypes that are perpetuated by the media, community, peers, or colleagues? Can you recall a situation in which someone you know was affected by bias? And do you stand up for people when you know that they feel they don't belong or are being excluded? And if yes, what do you do? 
So we will speak later in this module about bias and how it affects IVP and injury uh, violence uh, rates uh, and prevalence incidents among different groups and population. So the last uh, basic category of self-reflection is assessing knowledge about definition of DEI, health equity, and social justice, and whether you can define those terms. And would you be able to explain this concept to a family member, to a friend, to a colleague? How often do you speak about these topics for either professional or personal purposes? So thank you for spending a few minutes thinking about these questions. But I think that those are good questions also to bring to your own organizational meetings to prompt reflection and action in addressing IVP and IV inequities. So as we spoke so far about mental models and biases, before we summarize examples of mental models and how they contribute to bias and inequities, please let me share a definition for mental models. Uh, mental models include assumption, categories, concepts, identities, prototypes, stereotypes, casual narratives, and worldview. They affect how we perceive everyday life and we in our own decision-making process. They capture broad ideas that are supported by many others in society, and they contribute to ideology. For example, several studies suggest that caregivers' mental models of injuries are likely to be informed by interactions among children, caregivers, and the environment where they live work and play. In this context, for example, mental models may influence the way caregivers view concussion symptoms in relation to degrees of seriousness and their perception of the need for medical treatment. So mental models also shape institutional, social, and community norm policies and practices. And they influence most decisions in daily life because are also reinforced by social pressure. If without shared mental models, it may be very difficult for people to develop organizational policies and intervention, develop shared solution, understand each other, or even feel a sense of belonging and empathy. So mental models really shape our decision-making process and thinking uh, on a variety of different topics. So as applied to injury and violence prevention, mental models that focus solely on individual responsibility may confirm and expand biases to a specific groups it ultimately blame people who have been historically marginalized, maybe medically under-resourced or experience other kinds of disadvantage because of limited investment in the health and social systems to which they have access versus more privileged segment of the population. This may be may wrongly confirm and expand biases and social discrimination by suggesting that such groups are responsible for their own injuries because of risk-taking behavior or lack of attention to prevention measure instead of the vulnerability of the health and social systems to which they have access. While individual responsibility is important, a mental model focusing on individual responsibility cannot be more misguided, as people face many barriers in their lives and community that affect their ability to prevent injury and violence. Instead, mental models that focus on uh, collective responsibility to prevent injury violence and addressing the many social and political factors that contribute to, to high rates of injury and violence and effective prevention measure promote a system and equity driven approach to prevention and addresses the need, values and priority of the people most affected by inequities by removing barriers to prevention, including the many social and political determinants that, that are key factors in determining injury and violence. So with that said, uh, now that we had a chance to reflect on mental model advice, please let's take a look at DAI in mothers. There are many definitions of DAI out there, but one that is among my favorites is the definition of the DAI extension, which is a project of the Extension Foundation Impact Collaborative. And you see their website here. And in this definition, diversity is the presence of differences that may include race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, social economic status, language, disability, political perspective, 
major religious commitment in our communities, in our organization, in the way we think, in the values that we represent. Equity is about promoting justice, impartiality, and fairness within the process, the procedures, and distribution of resources by our own institutional systems. And inclusion is actually an outcome to ensure those who are diverse actually feel or are welcome, and inclusion outcomes are met when you and your institution and your program are truly inviting all. They make You make sure that everyone has a sense of belonging to that institution, to that community, to that group. So with that said, what is the relevance of DEI to injury and violence prevention? Uh, under this model, um, injury violence is a generalized structural problem with many root causes and many contributing factors, which are all of social and political nature. Maybe socioeconomic status that doesn't allow people from low socioeconomic status may have so many quick conflicting priority, multi jobs. They may not prioritize injury and violence prevention because their life is too busy by conflicting priority places and other forms of social discrimination. And for example, on this particular uh, contributing factor, if we look at the unfairness uh, or the kind of implicit or explicit bias in our society, many people may have to work community of colors. We know this is greatly contributed to structural racism. To quote John Powell, author of Racing to Justice, an important book on this topic and much more, biases not only affect our perception, but our policy and institutional regimen. Therefore, these biases influence the types of outcomes we see across a variety of contexts, school, labor, housing, health, criminal justice, and so forth. This, uh, Racialized outcomes subsequently reinforce the very stereotype and prejudice that initially influenced the stratified outcomes. And this is a quote from John Powell's uh, book uh, on uh, author of Racing to, to Justice. So I just want to say that basically this implicit or explicit bias once again reinforced structural racism. And this goes back to the shared mental model that we were discussing before, which influences basically institutions, policy, and decision making process, including the resource allocation for injury and violence prevention on the basis of existing privilege, on the basis of existing, and not on the basis of existing need. And unfortunately, many communities don't experience this privilege, and therefore, resource allocation is minimal toward injury and violence prevention. So other examples are social and gender norms, workplace and housing condition. Obviously, in within poor housing condition, you know, we know that injury is more common. Neighborhood, the place facing inequity, where people have safe spaces, safe, safe parks where to congregate, where to play, where to run, and so on. And limited resources is always an underlying issue because investment in communities have been historically marginalized or, or from low socioeconomic status may remove barriers to basically adequate prevention. So DIA-driven strategies are key to removing barriers to effective IVP. So moving on, what is health equity and why it matters? Again, here, there are many definitions of, of health equity. This is a definition we developed for health equity initiative. And, in, in, and we define health equity as providing every person with the same opportunity to stay healthy or effectively cope with disease crisis, regardless of their socioeconomic condition, race, gender, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, social status, and other socially determined factors. And uh, providing the same opportunity means also identifying and addressing community and group specific barriers that prevent people from leading healthy and productive lives. I want also to basically reflect a bit on this concept of opportunity. And opportunity is a very much talked about concept, but we know that opportunity has different costs and different level of accessibility for different groups and stakeholders. So it's very important to keep in mind this idea on which health equity is actually funded, that we need to work on the social and political determinant of wealth and the, the root causes of inequity. And we need to identify and address the barriers that people experience in implementing health behavior, preventative behavior, social behavior, they may be benefiting their life and, and well-being. So, Health equity lens should be at the core of IVP intervention. And what does he mean? Opportunity for IVP for all. 
by basically distributing resources in those communities that needs more resources, for example, for preventing injury and violence. A focus on addressing the social and political determinants of injury and violence. It, it overall, this can be accomplished through, a, through an overall policy and social norm change, of which IVP you know, basically is an important component because he fosters this policy and social norm change. But in order to basically to be effective in policy and social norm change, we need to actually ask the real expert on their needs, priorities, and values, which are the communities and the families. We may be the expert in IVP, in public health, in communication. We may understand how to craft a policy or design an intervention, but the real expert in basically their needs, value, and priorities are the communities that we belong to, are the communities that we serve, and they should be involved in the design, implementation, and evaluation of all intervention. Also, we need to think about place and community-specific solution, as health equity is a concept that is very community-specific because in one place may basically health equity uh, barriers, sorry, health equity may be achieved by removing barriers to transportations uh, because people cannot reach health care services. It's not easy for them to reach a health care service if a child comes on with a concussion or anything else because of lack of adequate transportation system. In other communities, maybe other reasons. So, so also the other important thing is to build a resource trust through basic basically community engagement by asking community leaders how to build and restore trust. In this community, they've been historically marginalized, where trust has been broken, or in this community that haven't had an opportunity to build basically the health literacy and resiliency skill that are needed to actually distinguish evidence-based information for information that is being politicized, that is actually not evidence-based. All across this, we need to use a multi-sectorial approach because we cannot do it all from one single sector. We need to look at the system in which people live, age, play, work, and we also need to uh, basically uh, work on advocacy and championship across different uh, types of organizations. Uh, so what does he mean framing diversity, equity, and inclusion in IVP intervention and strategy? What are some of the concept and ideas we can start incorporating. First, let me start with an overview of Healthy People 2030 and uh, the goals they established for IVP. We know that uh, Healthy People 2030 is the public health agenda of the United States for the next several years, and their goal is to prevent violence and related injuries or deaths and to prevent injuries, and there are multiple objectives in support of this goal. Uh, so IVP is also discussed within the social determinant of health and social cohesion framework, and basically is is considered injury, crime, and violence as a social determinant of health because neighborhoods with a higher level of injury, crime, and violence obviously have also uh, basically poorer health outcomes and across a variety of indicator and uh, and uh, diseases. So, but we actually need a new paradigm. We need a paradigm for which uh, injury and violence rates are, yes, key determinants of health, but also key determinants of health and equity also influence injury and violence rates. What does it mean? It means that we know that basically uh, things like housing condition affects health, but also affects rates of injury when there are poor housing condition. We know that basically neighborhoods that basically don't have access to adequate healthcare uh, services affects health, but also uh, affects injury and violence rates. Because for example, if there are not adequate healthcare services, people cannot take care of both the physical and mental health issues that may ultimately basically uh, uh, result in injury or violence. So I th this paradigm shift basically uh, assumes an integration of these two different concepts. So what does he mean? This is, uh, we know that COVID-19 and other recent crises have demonstrated health is social. 
and that we have so many social political factors determining our ability to reply to a public health emergency as COVID-19 was, but to any kind of emergency like injury and violence. So we need to move from a disease or issue-based approach, which has a focus on health condition, on medical causes and symptoms, on the patients and the people around them who may influence them. And it's often oblivious of the root causes that may determine positive health outcomes or not, positive prevention outcomes or not, and therefore has limited sustainability in the long term to a social determinant of health approach in which we address the root causes in the living and working environment of people. And we look at health and injury and violence prevention as part of an integrated approach to community development in which repairing roads, in which providing people with more opportunity, in which providing people with better quality of healthcare services yes, contributes to health and to IDP, but also contribute to the prosperity and overall development of the community. This paradigm shift also assumes that we actually re rely on community and patient engagement to support health behavior, to support prevention, and we rely on them as the expert on their needs, values, and priorities, and this expertise needs to inform the design, implementation, and evaluation of all intervention. And of course, our approach should be founded on cultural humility, empathy, and diversity and inclusion. So there are several models uh, and frameworks to be considered for implementation in intervention and policy design. I'm highlighting these two frameworks by the World Health Organization, which are also used in the context of injury and uh, a violence prevention. The first one on the left uh, starts with ensuring that policy choice do not make inequity worse, do not do not do harm is an important pro pro principle also in injury and violence prevention. Also focus on addressing our consequences for the most disadvantaged groups, for the groups that have been historically marginalized, for the ones who don't have the resources or the time or the, the ability to prioritize injury and violence prevention, reduce the gap between the most advantaged and the most disadvantaged population is seek to flatten the gradient across the whole population by actually also measuring whether we are reducing injury violence prevention, not all in the general population, but actually in specific groups that may be most affected or more in need of resources. So the, the, the model on the basically uh, right is, tells us how we can actually work at different level of the socio-ecological model of health at individual, at the population, and so on, the, the, for actually addressing basically the inequities that can arise at different level. For example, there are differential consequence, consequences at the individual level of injury and violence, because people from lower socioeconomic status may not have, been, have the ability from bouncing back so easily from an injury. For example, they may not have access to quality of care services, and they may not have jobs that uh, provides them with pay leave or with enough medical leave to take care of the injury and go back on their feet. And this applies across the model. So in intervening, analyzing, and measuring, we really need to take into account the socioeconomic context and position, the differential exposure, to injury, which presents uh, people with other vulnerability, depending on condition of the workplace or the housing in which they live, and the differential vulnerability that a specific group may have to specific kind of injury and differential health outcomes and differential consequences so across all of these different levels. And this can help us plan and uh, intervene, analyze, and measure. So what are some implementation channels? First, the mental model. So we have seen before this mental model based on individual responsibility instead of a system-driven approach. This is just one of the mental models that may basically uh, be a barrier to implementation of a social determinant of health perspective or a DEI perspective to injury and violence prevention. Limited resources, we need more investment in basically uh, health equity in general and racial equity and social equity and all of these uh, 
uh, key, basically, uh, issues of our time. There is a limited capacity for community and family engagement. There are a lot of organizations who don't have the experience uh, with community and family engagement, so we need to build that capacity. There is a lack of prioritization across many public health and health care agenda and organization, and we need this kind of... Uh, you know, lack of prioritization or resistance in some organization, but also, also through having an internal process of discussion or dialogue or, of understanding biases and also involving basically people at different levels of the organization. So this calls for a DEI and health equity lens to be mainstream. And we know from the pandemic that health inequities became so prominent in the media and in other settings. And now we already see that they are not so spoken about in the media. So we really have to continue to actually mainstreaming them in our organization, in our communities, in our work, in our personal life, and making sure that these lens of DEI and health equity are being mainstreamed. So we are the ones we have been working, waiting for a support and the title from one of my favorite books. So they are simple strategy to overcome barriers. The first one is data disaggregation. Uh, collect data, disaggregated them by race, ethnicity, and luggage, because that will allow you to see if gains are really also in the groups in which those gains are needed the most. Close the gap by prioritizing policies intervention that are evidence-based, that have at least the same or more impact on groups that have been marginalized or experience other kinds of disadvantage. They address barriers to IDP, the social and political determinants of uh, health and equity, which also apply to IDP, uh, prioritize also policies and intervention that engage the community, that promote ownership of the community, including the most affected groups by injury and violence, the groups that have been historically marginalized or experienced vulnerability because of workplace condition, or licensing condition, or other kinds of disadvantage. Force a multilateral collaboration. We cannot, no one of us can do this alone. It addresses system vulnerability of health and social systems because the COVID 19 pandemic, you know, highlighted so many of those vulnerabilities. Um, moving along, other simple strategies to become an advocate in your own organization on the inclusion of the DEI or equity lens in IDP. Also build capacity across professional sector, community and cities, because capacity make people feeling more comfortable uh, embracing this concept and integrating in their organization and work. And start with your own organization, with assessing organizational bias that may be present in your own organization and build the capacity for both DEI and health equity uh, among the key departments, among everyone in your organization, because this is really a process that involves all. I wanted to also remind us that the literature uh, on uh, basically prevention and policy that uh, to address disparities in uh, IDP, in, in injury and violence prevention, in injury and violence rates is really lacking, it's very limited. Many studies aggregate types of trauma in patient groups, uh, preventing and understanding of distinction between groups and potential intervention. And so intervention and community-based research strategy were limited across this 2021 uh, to 2019 systematic review. And future research can better specify measurements. And this go back to this idea of uh, data disaggregation. We also discussed before that we need to disaggregate data by type of injury, by type of violence, by different groups uh, and collect real data. So, so how do we influence policy solution? Also it starts with working with communities and local CBOs to understand their priorities and the issues that are at stake within each community, focus on solution and control the community itself, uh, build capacity within communities and key stakeholders and key groups for policy action and advocacy, develop alliance with local media. There are a number of uh, you know, basically individual media and also media alliances that they may really amplify your message and help engage others on the issue, expose people to alternative ways of thinking that prioritize these uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens uh, and health equity lens in the prevention of injury and violence, uh, encourage action and increase investment in addressing inequities in this field and build very broad local coalitions. Uh, 
So where do you start? Foster cultural engagement with equity-driven mental models in your organization and community it starts with you. You can start speaking about it, calling meetings about this and so on. Keep a sharp focus on what is the benefit to the community you serve, to the patient you serve, and to social change or transformation in general, to the prosperity of those communities. Consider potential bias among different stakeholders and making sure that you analyze this bias, that you provide safe spaces to discuss them so they can be really understood and removed from the organization decision-making processes. Map key influential. Be inclusive of those groups that have been historically marginalized or experienced disadvantage because these are the groups whose needs you need to meet. Appoint champions, dedicate efforts within your organization, dedicate departments, dedicate to health equity and DEI, and dedicate these departments, not because they are the only one who will be responsible for implementing this DEI and health equity lens in your organization, but because they, it will be sort of a coordinating body for making sure everyone understands the importance of moving forward with this frame. Engage the communities in all of the phases of design, implementation, and evaluation of intervention and policy, and keep advocating for increased funding and new policies that privilege DEI and health equity. So in summary, the idea of integrating a DEI health equity lens in the RVP is still in its infancy, unfortunately, but there is an opportunity for you to be a champion and advocate for such integration. This is a critical step toward improving condition for all when it comes down to injury and violence prevention. And the, you need to address, the, there is a big need to address mental models in our society that may not look at the system change, but they may look at individual responsibility only. And we need, and we know that there are many barriers to, to prevention, many barriers to healthy behaviors that people face, and these need to be addressed in our society. Uh, also, we need to address implicit systemic biases, which uh, actually uh, influence resource allocation, policy and intervention in many organizations and community, and other root causes of IVP and IB inequities. Uh, central to this effort is community and family engagement, making sure that you recognize the expert in everyone and provide ownership of intervention and policy. Multi-sectoral collaborations, because we really need the investment and the contribution of multi-sectors, public health and urban design and IVP professionals and a variety of different uh, stakeholders. And capacity building and training is the foundation of everything else, of everything we do, including, you know, basically in uh, policy and intervention design. So I hope this model started to build some blocks for future trainings and capacity building. So thank you very much. And remember this really takes a village. We really need the investment of all levels of society uh, from policymakers to public health, to urban designers, to IT people, to medical professionals, to clinicians, to so on. So that really basically to integrate health equity lens in IVP and in any other kind of issue. So this is my, these are some resources uh, from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention or the World Health Organization or the Prevention Institute that you may use to start looking at uh, basically at a focus on health equity and DEI in your work uh, in injury and violence prevention. And this is uh, my contact information. Uh, so thank you very much for listening, and I hope this was a useful building block or in uh, for your work and uh, and for your work and uh, personal endeavors. Thank you so much for your attention, and good luck with your important work.